very warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us uh, for the third year or the inaugural session of our third year of business life. Uh, we have a great speaker today uh, who will be speaking on the uh, uh, topic of eukaryogenesis, which we started uh, in the last year. Uh, before we begin with the session, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, the Burgess Trust, uh, the Burgess International Society, who have uh, been uh, so wonderful with supporting us for this uh, uh, for these live sessions, and also the participants who have uh, uh, who have been joining us uh, for the past two years uh, regularly to listen to these amazing sessions by these uh, by some of the great speakers uh, that we invite uh, for the business life. Today we have an excellent speaker, uh, Professor Krista Schlepper, who have uh, who has agreed to become the inaugural speaker for our third year of uh, business life. Uh, professor Krista Schlepper is a professor in microbiology at the University of Vienna since uh, 2007. She did her PhD with uh, Wolfram Zilling. Many of you know him. Uh, uh, very well. Uh, for those who are unaware, he is one of the pioneers in RPR research uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. And she was a, a professor, Krista Schlepper was a postdoc at Caltech and UC Santa Barbara, and then an assistant professor at Darmstadt uh, Technical University in Germany, and a professor of microbiology at the University of Bergen, Norway. Uh, Krista has more than 30 years of experience of working with the uh, RPA. Um, her current research involves uh, CRISPR defense systems in hyperthermophilic sulfur lobules, ecology and metabolism of ammonia oxidizing RPA, and the more recently discovered Asgard RPA. Um, Professor Schlepper is a member of the EMBO, the American Academy of Microbiology, and the Austrian Academy of Sciences. In 2022, she received the uh, Wittgenstein Award, the highest scientific recognition in Austria. So that's a very big achievement. Congratulations, uh, Krista, on that. Uh, she is also engaged in sustainability topics and is the main organizer of the interdisciplinary lecture series, uh, which is called as the Climate Change and Climate Crisis. Uh, it is conducted at the University of Vienna. And her lab has also founded greenlabsaustria.at, which is a website with an aim to connect Austrian and international laboratories that share the vision of sustainable research. Uh, so Krista, uh, I welcome you uh, for this uh, inaugural session and thank you for accepting uh, our invitation on a very short notice. And uh, the screen is all yours. Thank you. So thank you very much for this very kind introduction and hello everybody worldwide. I don't know, it's morning or evening for you. For me, it is the early morning, I must say. I'm really happy uh, to be able to talk here. And yes, thanks again for uh, this invitation. Um, I have realized, um, I start with a disclaimer. I've realized this is quite a big title, you know, for what uh, uh, I'm going to present maybe an ambitious title, but I'm really happy to share some more recent results also and um, to go back into the discovery, actually, um, the beginning of the of the Asgard Archaea. And this is usually not my field of research, as you might have understood from the introduction. I'm mostly working on um, Archaea that are involved in environmentally relevant issues, in particular ammonia oxidizing Archaea in terrestrial environments. So actually the eukaryogenesis, the origin of eukaryotes is not or has not been all the time in the major focus of my research. So it's rather um, a new momentum now that we have in our laboratory, but yeah, I'm happy to be able to share this with you. So I start with the tree that you all um, are aware of, I guess, that was published in 1990 by Calvos and colleagues, and which shows the three domains of life as it was um, seen or as it is still seen by some. And um, what this tree shows is, of course, the discovery that archaea are very distant to bacteria, but also that the root that has been placed is in the bacterial branch, meaning that we have an early split in evolution for um, two lineages. One is the bacterial lineage and the other one is the lineage that goes to archaea and eukaryotes 
considering phylogenomic and phylogenetic analysis. And this, um, this view that archaea and eukaryotes share a common ancestry um, has been supported a lot by molecular data when we look into the molecular biology of archaea. And this has been early on a discovery that was actually starting in Wolfram Zillig's lab. And as you mentioned, this is where I did my PhD. So I was also involved in these um, early days in the 1990s when it was still a hot topic. And so it was actually Wolfram Zillig's lab who set the foundation, which leads to uh, this picture that the RNA polymerases uh, that transcribe DNA, um, that the RNA polymerases of archaea and eukaryotes share a lot of uh, homology share a lot of uh, subunits, um, uh, showing that actually the invention of transcriptional, the transcriptional apparatus uh, happened in the common ancestor of what led to archaea and eukaryotes nowadays. And this has been supported by many more findings, the idea that molecular machines in archaea um, are quite similar to eukaryotes, although simpler. This is, for example, also found in the replication machinery, uh, which I just list here from a paper from 2003. So you can see that in archaea, the origin of re recognition proteins, for example, are shared, at least some. They are more diversified in eukaryotes, but they are shared among all archaea. And this is true for the helicases and other um, proteins that are involved in replication, not the polymerase itself, but a lot of associated factors in the replisome, for example. And we have more examples of this, that the molecular machinery is in archaea, in particular those that, um, that have to do with information processing, that those are, are um, invented in, in the lineage together that led to archaea and eukaryotes. So the idea that archaea have a lot to do with the evolution of eukaryotes has been around, of course, the whole time for everybody who is working on archaea. And, um, and as you know, it has gained more momentum now, or you have heard about it maybe, with the discovery of Asgard archaea. Um, so I really like this picture, actually, from a very nice book, Evolution. Um, that depicts the original idea, uh, Senzu Calvos, where we have a proto-eukaryote, you know, that gave rise with a merge of the of an uh, of a bacterium to the to the eukaryotes, uh, the eukaryotic cells as we know them nowadays. But the new momentum is now that we have Asgard archaea, and the discussion arises in how far this partner on this side of the tree is indeed. Um, an ancestral lineage of archaea, which happened two billion years ago. So whenever I analyze and study now Asgard archaea, I'm very aware of the fact that we are studying nowadays Asgard archaea and not the ones that have been around two billion years ago, maybe. So one has to, to keep this in mind. So with this very short introduction, um, I would like to start um, to share with you the story of Loki Archaeota um, from my view of Loki Archaea and Asgard Archaeota. It started actually in Norway, where I was a professor um, for three years, and we were involved in studying the environments around Loki's castle. Loki's castle was discovered and described then in 2010 by geologists in Bergen, um, who found the northernmost um, hot vent on the ultra slow spreading ridge, because it's so far north, it's the ultra slow spreading ridge north of Iceland. So here you have Iceland, I hope you can see my cursor, and north of uh, Norway here and Scandinavia. And um, so this was, uh, a very interesting finding in principle, but it also um, then gave rise to more molecular studies around Loki's castle. So this is the hot vent itself as it was found and described with fauna and microbiology. But actually my group was involved in studying sediments that were quite distant from this place. So here's Loki's castle and the GC14, the first genomic sequences that uh, were published on Loki Archaea are quite far away and also in a deeper layer um, around Loki's castle. So maybe a kilometer away or so. 
And uh, this is where a PhD student of mine took samples um, and analyzed the microbiome in those sediments. And this was a huge opportunity. This was a great uh, study because these sediments are very special. So um, they are actually influenced by the hot vents. They are not hot. They are just um, um, of low temperature. But here you see a real photograph. I can show you maybe better on the next slide. You see a real photograph of the sediment layer, about three meters of sediment, and you see that it's highly stratified, which is quite unusual, and it's influenced by the fallout from these hot vents still, although it is quite distant. And this gave us the opportunities to study these stratified layers in their different um, depths and to find different, more distinct communities of microbes in the distant layer that were not so much mixed as they are usually in sediments. So this actually then helped to show what is expressed in this title to correlate microbial community profiles with geochemical data on a highly statistical level. For the first time, one could actually have predictors for which environmental parameters actually help maybe spread certain organisms. And so in these layers, I focus in now again, we found certain areas like here in two meter depths in this particular one of organisms that were highly enriched, which back then were called deep sea archaeal groups. So this is based merely on 16 srRNA gene based studies of the microbiome. And the numbers up here express the percentage of um, ribosomal RNA genes of the total ribosomal RNA genes in those different layers. And you can see that there are layers like this one where you have 50% or even more of all 16 sRNA sequences belonging to this, which back then was an unknown group of DSAC or marine benthic group B, it was also called, it was one of those mysterious lineages that um, nobody knew about what they might be doing. And you can see that, for example, this group here, MG1, it's called, this is the um, marine group one. This is the Taumakeota that we are also studying from terrestrial environments, so completely different uh, metabolism. And so we were able to dissect this group in particular, and the idea arose that we could use DNA from those layers, of course, to study these organisms better by metagenomics. And this worked at the end, but it was also very hard because the um, amount of DNA in these layers was um, very low, of course. You know, you have less, and you can see this on the next slide. Actually, this is a more detailed study of exactly the core from which the metagenomic sequencing of the first Loki Archaea was done. You see that the total amount based on qPCR in this layer is actually... Um, is actually much lower, but you can see that there's a full match, for example, in this depth here, there's a full match between the qPCR abundance that we measure for total, R for total archaea and for the deep sea archaea group, meaning that almost all archaea in this sample could be from, uh, from this particular group. So we were very optimistic back then that it should be very easy to study this. And we were trying to do single cell analysis, you know, single cell sorting and so on. But it was, it turned out to be quite difficult. And uh, when you hear more about the Loki Archaea and also now the cultivations, uh, you might understand, you might appreciate that it was actually much more difficult than originally anticipated. But here it looked like there was really a high abundance and it should be relatively easy to study this group. So, um, so this particular layer was taken, you know, to prepare DNA. This is what Stefan did. He was a postdoc then in Bergen still. I had already moved to Vienna for some time. And, um, and we have given the DNA from these precious sediment layers actually to the, you know, excellent genomicists like uh, Thais Etema and... Uh, oops. Um, and other uh, groups, Lionel Guy and so on, and a lot of excellent genomicists who looked into this data and who assembled these data, which was quite a task back then because it was not an easy sample. And, um, and you might have seen this one. So this is the, the first study uh, by Spang et al. published in 2015, uh, where it became clear that when you do phylogenetic analysis, um, you have a group here which... Uh, which is now called Loki Archaeota or Loki Archaea. Um, and the phylogenies early then already pointed out that this, this might shift the view 
towards one direction, namely that the eukaryotic lineage is based on the very conserved genes among all organisms. A few conserved genes shows that eukaryotes actually branch off um, within the archaea part of the tree, if you want. But that was only one aspect. The other aspect is that concomitant with this, which was very exciting, there were found quite a few of um, eukaryotic, so-called eukaryotic signature proteins, which is a little bit of a misleading name because actin-like proteins, this is one example, the actins, actin-like proteins are also found in bacteria and also found in archaea. But the, uh, this particular signature protein is far more closely related to the eukaryotic variants. So in blue here, you see the eukaryotic actin proteins, and in red is depicted the, um, the actins that were found in the Loki archaeota genome assemblies. So it looks like they are really more closely, and we will come to this uh, when I discuss with you our recent isolates that we got now, well, not isolate, but enrichment more precisely. So this is one of these eukaryotic signature proteins. There are others, there are some, and I show you a general picture on the function. I have some problems with the cursor here. So there's, um, there's also a lot of escort proteins found uh, encoded in the genomes of um, Loki archaea and other Asgard archaea. So escort proteins, for example, escort three complex is um, involved in a lot of mechanisms that have to do with membrane remodeling in eukaryotes, like virus budding, cytokinesis, exosome, biogenesis, autophagy, and so on. And um, although escort-like proteins have been found in archaea before, um, the number of proteins and uh, associated proteins of these complexes are much higher in all ASCAR genomes. And this is also, this was also shown um, on this very first study in 2015, so that you find genes encoding um, these proteins. Maybe I have to take another pointer, let's see. Um, um, so you can find here, for example, a group of escort um, proteins that apparently have split early in evolution, like here's in blue, again, the eukaryotic variants, homologs, and in red, you see those from the Loki assembly and also some from the public databases back then. You can see that there's even an early split that can be seen uh, within this family, super family of um, VPS-like proteins. So there was a lot of evidence like this, more eukaryotic signature proteins in those genomes. In general, in the ASCAR genomes now, it is hundreds of proteins actually. And we will come to this in more detail uh, when I look at the enrichment that we have now. Um, in principle, I try to summarize it uh, this way now. In principle, there were some of these proteins that are now found in Asgard's, also in other lineages of Archaea. So here you have Tauma Archaeota, Crin Archaeota, you know, where there's also escort proteins encoded, ubiquitin systems, you know, some of those proteins that are considered um, eukaryote eukaryotic signature proteins, but it looks like we have a bigger assembly in the Loki archaeota yeah, to, um, to summarize this. So we have, we have a, um, a bigger assembly, we have more proteins from all these different families of eukaryotic signature proteins. So between 2015 and now, a lot of things have happened. A lot of people have joined the effort to, um, to study Asgard archaea. And I just summarized this very um, fast here in a, in a tree that was published um, in 21 um, by Liu et al. in Nature, um, where you can see all these different lineages now that we have for the, for the Asgard Archaea. This is why they were collectively called Asgard, I think by Thais, uh, Etima and others. And uh, we have a lot of gods now because they were all named um, for the Asgard um, uh, mythology right at the beginning and so we have all these god names which I find a little bit funny because we are talking about deep evolution but we are using names of gods as if we are creationists which we are not but uh, this is what it looks like but I'm happy to see that there's also uh, now a, a Chinese um, 
God name involved the Wukong Archaeota now. And um, so this is ever expanding. A lot of genomes, I think by now there is about 172 metagenome assemblies, but only very few fully, um, fully closed genomes from enrichments. And so, yeah, this is uh, expanding the story, of course, quite a bit. And also the finding of more eukaryotic signature proteins. So now we can get a broader picture. Are these proteins really widely spread in this huge Asgard phylum, which is now a phylum? And for example, um, so here you have again the Asgard, the escort family proteins in all these different lineages of Asgard, Archaeota and the Hale, Archaeota, Loki, Archaeota, and so on. This is a, from a paper in 2019 in the Heimdall Archaeota, Tor, and um, and what you see is that they, these escort proteins are widespread. They are not fully present everywhere, but these are also genome bins. They are not all closed. So uh, actually, most of them are not. So if there's a gene missing, it could be because the genome is not closed or because it's really missing, of course. And then you have also, again, a lot of these cytoskeleton uh, proteins. And I would like to point this out particularly now. So some of these have been studied in other systems, heterologously expressed. There have been excellent studies on profilin and gelsolin, for example, also tubul tubulin that occur. Mostly profilin and gelsolin have been studied. And these are remodeling proteins kind of involved in the actin um, cytoskeleton of eukaryotes. And so it is. it has become a big prediction, actually, that um, these actin proteins, especially this conserved Loki actin, and we will come to this later in my talk, this very conserved Loki actin that you find in almost every metagenome bin of the Asgard archaea, um, uh, that this should be involved in forming a cytoskeleton. This could be involved or other related proteins and that this cytoskeleton might even be dynamic because we also find profilins and gelsolins. And so this has been an, um, an outstanding question then. Was there a complex and maybe even dynamic cytoskeleton already before the emergence of eukaryotes? If we put this together, and this is the current hypothesis by many people, and I must say I also tend to think this, that together with phylogenetic studies and these findings, it might indeed be that by studying Asgard Archaeota, we understand much better uh, the origin of eukaryotes. So that is uh, one of the questions. And yes, we will come to this. But first of all, um, I have to introduce this seminal study that was done by Imachi et al. from the Japanese group who were the first to actually present an enrichment of a Loki Archaeon, Prometheus Archaeum Syntrophicum, um, which is living in syntrophy um, as a hydrogen producer, most probably mostly um, as it is living with hydrogen consuming organisms. So here on the left side, you see an earlier or an, a lower enrichment. And on the right side, you see quite a high enrichment of 87% of this um, Prometheus Archaeum Syntrophicum. And this is really an amazing study. It took many years and um, it was great because it also brought together findings. From what I understood, um, the group was enriching microorganisms from the deep ocean. And when the Spang et al. paper came out with these first metagenomes of Loki Archaea, um, they saw that it is in their ferment and they could focus on this and concentrate and enrich it. And by having done it now myself in our group, I really more and more appreciate this amazing study because um, it must have been hard and tedious, of course. And also one has to say these cells grow only to very low cell density. So um, the more amazing I find that these beautiful pictures have been uh, have been taken and um, and this has guided our enrichment studies, and uh, I will come to this in a later point. So now, after this introduction and also my previous studies on Lokia care um, in the sediments of the Norwegian um, ridge, I would like to come to this more recent study that we have done on shallow sediments, on isolation of Lokia care from shallow sediments. And this has been published in December 1st and now in print also this January. And the major players in this um, enrichment were people from my lab, Thiago Rodriguez Oliveira and Rafael Ponce Toledo, 
who are co-first authors together with Florian Wollweber, a postdoc from ETH Zurich in Martin Pilhofer's lab. And then there's other people who have been um, instrumental actually to make this study happen. Yingwei Xu is also co-author. Andreas Klingel did the first um, pictures. And then we have a lot of technical assistance for this really um, tedious work. So what did we do? So in 2000, I don't know, 15, we started um, to look into all our DNA samples that we have collected over the years, because I'm doing student classes in all kinds of places around Vienna, but also further away. So we found Loki Archaea signatures in many places, also right here in Vienna, in the Danube River sediments and um, and also in marine sediments. So we also regularly go to the first place to reach an ocean from Vienna. So Austria is not having any oceans, ocean sites. So we go to Slovenia. So this is a place in Slovenia where we regularly go to take samples. And on the left side here, you see actually the places where we find Asgard Archaea in very shallow sediments. And um, so by looking into all our DNA samples in the lab, we found by PCR that some of these samples in in Piran have uh, relatively high amounts of uh, Lokis and relatively high for shallow sediments means like 5% in 16S RNA studies. And so a lot of uh, cultivation efforts were done mostly by Tiago, who is uh, one of the first authors of this paper that came out. And so we did a lot of, you can imagine all these permutations you can do with all kinds of different um, situations, you know, ingredients that you can give to a medium. We were trying out a lot. And we were also trying out to, um, to cultivate these organisms in large fermenters. And, um, and then, yeah, and then we enriched. And maybe I can show this better in the next picture. So what, so what we do is we take sediments, layers, very shallow, as you can see. Um, and we do first enrichments in the native um, medium. And then we uh, actually switched in between also to the medium of Prometeoarchaeum. And later then we made big steps actually for the enrichments by minimizing this medium. And, uh, and this is when actually Thiago got the good, big breakthrough. So now we have regularly cultures of like 80% enrichment. And when you look at this and the number of transfers that are needed to obtain a culture of 80% enrichment, you think that this is really relatively easy and fast. It could be, but actually it was of course involving a lot of other and um, a lot of other experiments that did not work. And this is what we found out how it was when we traced back. So it was about two and a half years from the inoculum to actually getting this higher enrichment. And so we followed this up in the, the different steps. We followed this up by doing ribosomal RNA, 16S sequencing, and seeing how the enrichment proceeds. So here you see different sediment layers with all the diversity on phylum level for bacteria and archaea. And then you see how selective, of course, the medium is in the different conditions. And this was about the stage when we found more or less stably a low amount in red, the Loki archaea in low amounts. We found them more and more stably when we changed conditions. But the really high enrichment was a tedious work to minimize the medium. And so, yeah, this is what it looks like um, to tell you a little bit um, how difficult it was. And we encounter also other difficulties. Uh, when we grow the organisms, we can have very long leg phases. So this is our, our positive example, right? Where we have leg phases of only a month. Sometimes we had several months of leg phases, but we have consistently now doubling times of seven to 14 days. But another challenge that we have is that the cultures tend to die after a while. If we don't passage them fast enough, they tend to die. So it uh, needs to be very carefully monitored, actually, growth. And we can only monitor growth by qPCR because the cell density is relatively low. And But it's still, it's like 10 to the 7. So it's comparably high if you want, but it's actually in the range of other organisms that we grow in the laboratory. So our best cultures have a consortium, which is um, which consists of our Loki strain B35, and then sulfate reducers, methanogens, um, and a few other organisms. And this is what it looks like in uh, fish analysis with specific probes for the Loki archaea, 
and we can detect also the bacteria. Of course, this is a concentrated sample. We can take the, detect the bacteria and uh, the methanogens, of course, also in those cultures. So it's still a mixed culture that we are working on. And so the first pictures that we got, um, they look like this. And um, so this is scanning electron microscopy from Andreas Klingel in Munich. So you can see that there's similarity to uh, the organisms um, from the Japanese strain. And if you directly compare, there's also differences. On the right side, you see Prometheaceum centrophicum. On the left side, you see our enrichment from the shallow sediments. And um, some of these maybe blown up bubbles might be also a little bit artifacts or might, they might become bigger in the scanning electron microscopy. But in principle, we think there's a, a little bit of a difference in appearance, but of course they also have these long arms. And this is the moment I would like to tell you that um, it has helped us a lot um, that Imachi et al. published their study in 2020. We were amazed to see these long arms. And this is when we really stopped um, enriching uh, by stirring or by shaking because we understood maybe we are really disturbing the organisms and all our more old-fashioned little flasks that we used uh, were the ones that were most successful for higher enrichments indeed. So that was uh, one of the big hints actually we got from the study from the Japanese culture. So what does our organism look like? Loki B35. Um, it has a large genome. It is six megabases large. It's larger than the centrophicum genome, but we later looked and there are different genome bins from Loki Archaea that also show large sizes. And we are um, convinced actually that the assembly is fine. We have more than one ribosomal RNA operon. This is also found um, more often now. And um, and you can see that from the prediction, we have we have closed the genome, but from the prediction with the um, computer programs of single copy genes and so on, you also find uh, what you usually see, you know, the computational completeness is also above 90%. It is never 100% on the computational side. And also the contamination is, of course, a computational thing. We don't think that we have any contamination in this closed genome. And so we have mobile elements. Um, we have eukaryotic signature proteins in percent. This is around 5%. So it's the same amount, the same relative amount as in centrophicum, but there are more because it's a bigger genome. So it's like 250 eukaryotic signature proteins, if you want, that are classified as such. And from the average amino acid identity and other parameters, we uh, decided that this should be a different species. So the name is Lochiaceum ossiferum, and I will show you why in a moment. And I'm glad to say that in the context of this lecture at Business, that this name has been approved by Aaron Oren, and he actually suggested it. So, and you will see uh, why we call it like this. And uh, yeah, here you see another phylogenetic tree now including the closed genome of Lochiaceum ossiferum. And you see that it is very closely related to Promotiaceum centrophicum in a Loki group that has less um, organisms, if you want, because here the bigger branch is the Lochiaceota that are more abundant in environments. And here you have the, um, or that are more diversified also. And here you have other lineages within the Asgard Archaeota. Okay. So with this, I show you um, the eukaryotic signature proteins, a comparison, just the abundance. We wanted to find out why is this genome larger, but in principle, we don't find specific spots where we have a lot of genes that might have been acquired. It's actually spread out over the whole genome, the acquisition of additional genes, but there is kind of an increase in yellow. You see the ossiferum number, total number of proteins in the in the genome. So you see that there's more in the trafficking machineries and regulation um, found in this genome, whereas the other um, absolute numbers are more similar to the other organism. So there is 2,400 um, proteins shared, but there's also a lot of unique proteins to ossiferum and syntrophicum. Um, so what is the challenge of this organism? Um, there are big challenges. 
So we have, as I mentioned, uh, slow, relatively slow growth. Seven to 14 days is really fast for us now. We have unpredictable lag phases of several weeks, sometimes months, but it's getting better now. Actually, it is predictable. And uh, and often we think now that, it, that it's very clear, like how we have to deal with them to have uh, predictable lag phases when we passage. And we cannot fix the cells really nicely. We thought if we can fish, we can do fish fluorescence in situ hybridization. It means that we can do correlative microscopy, but we cannot because, in fact, the cells fall apart whenever you try to fix them for these kind of um, uh, hybridizations. They are difficult to monitor for growth, as I mentioned. So we have to do qPCR. We did a lot of qPCR in the past, a lot of technical help we had. And they grow to relatively low cell densities. They are difficult to concentrate. They cannot be centrifuged. They actually, it's not possible to concentrate them. So there is a lot of challenges involved with these kind of organisms. However, there's one huge, um, one huge advantage for these organisms. They are so small, they're below one micrometer that you can stick them into a cryo electron microscope. And you can look right inside. And this is uh, what makes it really interesting. So um, this was done, this whole study on the uh, cryo-EM was done in the group of Martin Pilhofer. This was a great collaboration, as I mentioned in the beginning, and it was Florian Wollweber who spent hours in particular at the beginning until he uh, was sure what he is seeing and so on to develop this. One example was, I think he spent 36 hours to see 17 specimen of Lokiakeum in the electron, in the, in the cryo EM. So it was also quite an expensive study considering um, this particular machine. So what does he see and how did we identify the organisms? So, so here he, um, he presents it from a low, lower resolution. Um, uh, the three types of organisms that we mostly have in the enrichment. So this is the halodisulfovibrio. vibrio. You have a typical outer membrane and cytoplasmic membrane of a gram-negative bacterium. And here you see the nice S layer of a methanogen. And in comparison to that, the Loki um, cell wall looks very different. We see one cytoplasmic membrane, and then we see a very interesting proteome on the outside. You can already see it here. I will show a few more pictures. We have these kind of lollipop structures, and then we have smaller lollipops, and we have more structures on the outside. Very variable, very unusual. But still, just by looking into the um, cryo-EM, we were not satisfied. We wanted to clearly identify the organisms, of course, to be sure that we are looking at the right thing. And especially because the culture is so low in concentration. So um, Martin Pilhofer and Florian came up with this great idea how to identify the organisms. We could see a lot of the ribosomes spread out in the cytoplasm. And what they did is, is an averaging of thousands of ribosomes that they could see and they could do a subtomogram average at 11.7 angstrom, uh, which means a high resolution uh, ribosome structure. And this actually could be used to identify the organisms because thanks to this study by Penef et al. in GBE, um, it was published that there are some supersized ribosomal RNA expansion segments in Asgard Archaea in the 23S RNA. So they have these expansions and it was possible to visualize them by overlaying crystal structures and so on with the structural um, average with the uh, structure that we got from Loki Archaeum. And it was possible to identify that these two ears here, these extensions actually can be assigned to these expansions in the 23 sRNA. So it was possible on the molecular level actually to identify which cell um, should stem from Loki Archaeum in this enrichment. And it was clear because there were no such expansions in the other organisms that we have in the metagenome. So we are quite convinced that uh, this was a very good argument to identify them. And so then it became more interesting, of course, now to look into the cell structure. Here you can see also the expansions when you look at a full cell. And just by looking inside the cells, what you see is the ribosomes and what you also see is filaments. These filaments here that we now know are actin filaments in the major cell body. You cannot see them all, of course. So here we look 
through this a little bit to give you an idea about it, about the abundance and, uh, and the distribution that we see on a full cell body, what we think is the major cell body at least. And uh, now this is stained, you know, visualized for you to be able um, to see. So, so this is what it looks like. We, in, in, in these preparations, at least, we see um, the ribosome spread out evenly in the cytoplasm, and we see the membrane and this uh, cell wall structure. And then you see in brown these, uh, these filaments in the cell body. And it becomes um, even more intriguing. So on the right, right side here, you see um, the overview of this picture. And it becomes even more intriguing. Oops. No, I have to think about how to go on. Hmm. Yes, here you see more uh, filaments that are actually extending from the what we think is the major cell body into protrusions from the cell, which are sometimes very round. And you see some of those filaments extending from the cell body inside the protrusion even. And, um, and here you see another um, example of it um, from by looking more into the extensions. So these are all extensions. This is not the major cell body we think, but a smaller, you know, like blab on the outside. And we do the same thing. We um, we scan through this now, and um, you can see that there's a lot of filaments actually in these long protrusions that we would find for the cells. You see that ribosomes are also migrating inside or that they are found, let's say, inside these long protrusions and also inside the end blabs that we see from the cells. And now this is now stained again and, and modeled for you. So you see that the um, filaments inside these protrusions are densely packed, really. There are also some protrusions that don't have these filaments. At least we should think this is also one, but many of them actually have these protrusions and they reach out into different, you know, elements of the cell. And um, so this was actually very fascinating. It's actually also easier to visualize the filaments um, inside the thinner protrusions when compared to the cell body. So it is harder to, of course, see them all in the cell body. Sorry, I'm mixing up where to click. So here you see more close-ups here on the left side um, of those protrusions. So you see that the ribosomes are arrayed like this quite often. You see very interesting, funny extensions like that look like Greek temples, you know, on these cell wall outsides. Here's a skinnier one, a different kind maybe. And you see again that there's these arrays of lollipops around on the cell wall. And there seems to be quite some flexibility and differences. We actually have a second strain now uh, enriched in culture, which uh, shows a little bit of a different cell wall. In principle, the same, but different distribution of the elements that we see. Sometimes we also see connections between cell protrusions and cell bodies. So yeah, this is uh, very fascinating to look at, but of course we also wanted to find out what is um, uh, what is the nature of this fil filament? Where does it come from? And so a big help was again, Jingwei Xu, who does the subtomogram averaging. Great job also in Martin Pilhofer's uh, group. And so he was able to get not as that high resolution, but to get a 24.5 angstrom subtomogram average. And you can model inside um, this filament, the actin, um, like a double filament, as it is typical for F-actin. And when you model inside this structure, also the F-actin from eukaryotes or the cranactin from cranacheota, um, you can see that it also fits. Yeah, so this is a very similar um, structure. It is, has similar dimensions, and it gives big hints that uh, one of the actins that we have encoded in the genome should be responsible for forming these filaments. So we try to find more evidence what kind of uh, filament this is, what it is made of, and um, and this is 
in the next slide. So I have to show you which kind of genes we have actually encoded in the Loki archaeum genome. Um, and it's interesting. So we have one, uh, we have, you have to dive a little bit into this. So this is an actin protein family tree. Here you have bacterial actin-like proteins, the crinactin, and all this here is Asgard actins from eukaryotes and Asgards. And, um, and here you have the bona fide eukaryotic actin in this group here. So there is the very conserved that I pointed out in the beginning, the very conserved actin um, that you find in all Asgard archaea and that also follows kind of the phylogeny or the distribution inside the different Asgard subgroups. And um, so this is the very highly conserved that you find everywhere. And so the actin-like um, proteins that we have also in the Loki archaeum genome, we have three more in our genome of our strain, um, they are distributed and there's not really a pattern. So those are quite divergent in the different Asgard archaea if they occur and how many of them and they are spread out along, uh, not following really the, the different phyla. But the Loki actin is different, it's very conserved. And indeed, this very conserved, what is called Loki actin, but what is in all Asgard archaea, is the one that is the most highly expressed in our transcriptomes and also what is not shown here in our proteomes. And so there is a big hint just from the expression level that it is this very highly conserved Loki actin that forms all these filaments. And we have more evidence than by staining. And this was also, again, a tricky part to do. This is, again, from Florian Wollweber, um, who did this kind of microscopy to actually visualize um, the, the actin filaments with a, a particular antibody. So we raised antibodies against peptides of this Loki actin, and we can stain this. And now we see how this actin actually, these filaments reach out into all these um, into all these protrusions that we see of the cells. So that was for us really the, the convincing proof that these, um, um, that these Loki archaea produce actin filaments and, um, and that they are probably involved in, um, in scaffolding the, the interesting shape of these organisms. So we call it Loki archaeum ossiferum, according to a suggestion from Aaron Oren, the skeleton carrier of the Loki Archaea. And uh, we have a lot to do now to study them further, but I would like them. Um, um, so, so we think that there is a pre-eukaryotic actin-based cytoskeleton um, in all these Asgard Archaea. I think one could extrapolate due to the high conservation, or I dare to extrapolate. So they are scaffolding the complex cell architecture. What else is their function? We can only speculate at the moment. We have some speculations, but we will see. We have to study further. We also see a single membrane organism with a complex surface proteome and an el elaborate um, cell architecture. So we think there might be a lot of cell-cell interactions going on and uh, yeah, interaction with the environment and everything. And I would like to present two theories here that have been brought up that would fit these ideas. So actually in 2014, Baum and Baum presented the inside out hypothesis for the eukaryotic cell. So this was before the discovery of Loki Archaea. And I remember well that Buzz Baum was a chairperson or so on a Gordon conference in 2019 after the Loki Archaeum genomes, the first ones were out, and he asked us all to draw our favorite idea what an Asgard Archaeon might look like. And he was the only one, because of his own theory here, who drew a picture that looked like very complex to the outside. All other people who made suggestions had inside complex ideas of, you know, membrane remodeling of vesicles inside. And But uh, he was the one who actually drew a very complex cell structure. And I must say, in this sense, he was right. What I don't like about this theory that he calls this an eocyte in this whole idea. So, because this refers to a very old model that I don't support. But the idea that there might be that eukaryogenesis could have arisen by an outgrowth from a cell on in, if you, you know, that growing around, and he had a lot of more molecular ideas why this could be the case, is not so bad. It's actually well fitting what we find, if you want, by heavily extrapolating from the idea that we have a complex cell structure 
that could, or you could also call it entanglement if you want, which was suggested um, by the group of Imachi when they found Prometheum. You could think about this intimate um, contact that could be made and then actually an outgrowth and you end up with the original cell as the nucleus and you form all these ER and internal structures during eukaryogenesis in very brief. Very interesting to read now, I think, in the context of these newer findings. So, um, yeah, this uh, so far to the theory of eukaryogenesis um, a little bit. So um, what we also have as a summary of my talk, um, uh, which is really great work from uh, Martin Pillow for his visual proteomics now to be able to identify on the single cell level organisms um, at high resolution. And this might really give ideas about how to study environments in the future and identify organisms. And what I find most interesting for our studies now, for our interests, is that we really have a model system that we can study well. We have a high enrichment and our cell concentrations are high enough actually to do protein chemistry, to do all kinds of molecular studies, although it's not trivial because the cells are very sensitive, but there will be a lot more to come actually because now we can really study uh, a lot of um, things of cellular features. And I really hope that this will give more clues about, um, about features that have been present before the first eukaryotes arose, but that might have been instrumental to make eukaryogenesis happen. So, of course, these are um, topics like what was the chromatin like in these cells? What is the chromatin like in these cells? Um, these escort proteins and all these things now can also be studied on enrichment cultures. And I'm sure there will be more enrichments coming as we all influence each other with our experiences now. And this will make the field really expanding and interesting, I think. And uh, yeah, and this is, I think, our contribution to the idea about what, what was maybe present in the first cells that made the eukaryotes come about. And I end with a very naive picture of... Uh, of my uh, eukaryogenesis, um, I don't want to go too far. So, but but I I think that taken all together, phylogenomic studies and features of eukaryotic signature proteins, in particular those that are highly conserved, might give us a clue about um, this event uh, that gave rise to the first eukaryote. And with that, I would like to end and thank again all these amazing collaborators actually who have helped in doing this study and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. It was really excellent and fascinating to see those structures and uh, the actins that you have actually stained and how the images progressed. I'm really uh, you know, amazed to see that uh, over the past 20 years, you've been able to you know, do such a lot of hard work and uh, being able to cultivate them eventually. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I would like to give really credit to the people who are willing to do this very tedious cultivation work, right? Who are spending a yeah. lot of time on this because it is a very risky project. There have been so many metagenomic studies but this is almost kind of safe, right? That you get data out and that uh, it's also amazing work, amazing work. And um, you need a lot of knowledge, right? To do proper analysis of these genomes, but cultivation is very risky. And I feel with every other group and people in those groups who are doing the cultivation, I must say. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Before I take the questions, actually, this is for the benefit of our uh you know, young researchers who are now in, in their final year of PhDs or becoming early career scientists. Um, I want you to highlight the importance of the uh, Professor Imachi's group, the Japanese group uh, discovery. Um, first question is, are you collaborating formally? Mm. No, we are not. I have never yes. met them. I've never met them, and I'm very, very uh, happy that I will meet them on a conference this summer. I think yeah. it was also due to COVID pandemics and so on that we have not met. And yeah. I'm really, really curious to hear from them. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, the question is actually uh, related to that, that, you know, if, if we have an open mindset 
about accepting new discoveries from uh, you know, so-called competing groups in science or collaborative groups in science where we have not really collaborated on a formal basis. Um, how important it is for the younger generation to have an open mindset to actually understand the discoveries and try to find you know, key points from them to use for your own research work that has benefited you. Like it's a simple thing that if you do shaking with these many uh, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> extracellular structures uh, hanging around, uh, you know, protruding from the main cell, you're going to break them apart. And that's going yeah. to disturb the actual cell structure itself. Yeah, yes, exactly. So it sounds so trivial, right? But we did not mm -hmm. come to this idea. So we had evidence, for example, of um, we also did enrichments in multi titer plates, you know, where they were also calm, and we saw high enrichments, really high, and we couldn't make sense why out of it, why we cannot upscale, you know, to have enough biomass because you have very right. little biomass in very small scale, it's also difficult. So, but we were never able to upscale. And we have this fascinating biotechnicum here with a lot of nice fermenters, we are growing so many archaea in larger volume, and we were just assuming that this should be the way to go and it was not yeah and so yeah this was an important hint but it is also sometimes not so obvious what we got from literature or from other people you know I had to really think about it hard with Tiago who did the enrichment over the years so what was the crucial point right also when right. we think of the medium and so on because I want to give credit about what we did right, right. and yeah so um but it is also an es estimation. I cannot even say for sure if this was the crew. I'm, I'm quite sure, but I have not done the experiment, right? Shaking and not shaking. I will not go back and start from scratch again to just find out if this was the point. I just think so, right? But still, I think we should give credit. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll be happy to take questions if you're ready. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from Alessandro Costa. Alessandro has been attending most of our sessions very dedicatedly, and he's been asking questions very to the point. Uh, I'll come to that. Um, the question is, it's first in appreciation. I really appreciate the flow of your career in publications. Uh, someone could speculate that ground ASCARD microorganisms could per participate in immunological imprinting having a role in T cell evolution and possibly regulating the history of species localization on Earth. Could you add information on this topic? Wow. I'm not sure if I understand the question even. Um, in T cell evolution. I, I think the question, uh, let, let me see. Alessandro, I'm allowing you to talk. Can you, can you uh, just uh, explain your question? Alessandro, are you there? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think it's more related to how the... Uh, is he there, <laughs> Alessandro? Okay, I, I don't think so. So anyways, I, I think it's it's more related to how these uh, Ascard archaea uh, could lead to, uh, you know, sort of evolution of the dendritic cells or the other, because dendritic cells also have similar structures protruding out of the main body. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of cells have this, right? I, I actually yeah. rather think that um, our cells mo look more like nerve cells. A little right. bit, that's what a lot of people have the association. I would even like to show you a picture, just a second. Yes. Of this calendar for the new year, I would like to show you. Doesn't this oh, wow. look exactly like Prometheo Archaeum? It does, right. doesn't it? It's a nerve cell. This is yes. really amazing. <laughs> and ours, actually. Yeah, but it's of course much bigger, right? The nerve cell. And ours uh, looks a lot like the one with the blebs that we have looks a lot like Capsaspora, an amoebae mm -hmm. with Philipodia, you know? And uh, it's interesting, but it's of course in a different scale, but it's, 
yeah, it will be interesting to explore like those similarities. Yeah, but I think in any way, I, I'm not sure because I don't want to speculate now how Alessandro meant it. But in any case, yeah. it is a lot of speculation involved. Yeah, unfortunately, in Alessandro <laughs> just wrote that he doesn't have a microphone. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So Maybe he can contact me. Yes. Yes. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Balaram Mohapatra. And the question is, uh, what are the most probable aqueous geochemical parameters that can tell us about the presence or absence, uh, presence and or metabolic activity of Loki archaeota members at these castles? Are there any clues? Yeah, um, actually the paper that I referred to at the very beginning where we did the QPCR about Loki archaeota in the deep sediments, there were correlations, but they were in general with organic material, organic carbon, there was a significant correlation with organic carbon and with sulfate, you know, but it is, um, uh, it is very general and maybe this is the favorable conditions for the partners that live with Loki, right? It is hard to tell what are really the specific conditions for Lokis, but there are some parameters if you look at the general distribution, and I think they are telling more. Um, and this is where do we find us guards in the environments, in marine sediments or in sediments in general, and our experience and also that of others, when I think about it, is that they love marine settings, they love marine sediments, and most of them needed anaerobic, right? So this is a good predictor for having Lokis, a better or Asgard's a better predictor to me than um, geochemical parameters. But it is true that organic carbon, I mean, they love to be in these dirty side channels at the ocean, for example, where you have more organic material in principle. For example, here in the Danube River, we find them regularly at the place where people walk their dogs and stuff. So yes, <laughs> there might be organic input from all sides, but what it really means to the specifics for the Lokis, I don't know. It's more the community that favors than Loki, right? Or Asgard. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Wiley Lin. And the question is, do other archaea also have the similar actin-based cytoskeleton besides Loki archaea? such as um, stack or urea here. This is a very smart question. I think it has not been looked in this detail yet, if they yes. also already have some form, right? Back then, mm -hmm. it was actually also Thais Etima and others who were involved in studying the Cranactin, but I think that the problem was more technologically, and I would love to do this now. I would love to see uh, cryo-EM pictures also of other archaea, with this resolution and with this, um, I, I, I think we might find surprises. Yes, it is true. Right. It might not only be in Asgards. I agree. Right. But they are nicely small, at least, you know, to be able to be studied now. But maybe one could also do more now with the Akia, with other Akia. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a, on similar line, I, I just got a question. Um, have you ever compared the cells uh, or the morphology of the cells, uh, the EM images, when you first enrich them and after, you know, continuous enrichment, um, I, I don't know how many years you've been enriching them now. Uh, yeah. Have you compared the micrographs from the first enrichment to the ones that are more recent? No, we haven't done this, but I think it would be really hard to do this because take a sediment, you know, and look in the microscope, it's a mess, right? And they yeah. are at very low abundance. So... Mm. We could maybe do this with a very deep sea sediment, but I think the shallow yeah. sediments, the relative abundance is much lower, right? right. Maybe yeah. we have the advantage that they grew to higher enrichments. But what we are going to do, what we are doing now, is to follow at least the shape. That's what you refer to, right? The shape during mm -hmm. growth, right? right? During growth stages. Kind right. of trying to synchronize them the best we can and find out when do they grow these protrusions and what are they for? We are doing a lot of experiments in this direction now. But the original okay. sentiment, I'm not so eager to look at even because I know it's going to be really hard. We have done this earlier, years yeah. ago. Yeah. Aaron also attends all our sessions and uh, he's just made a comment. Wonderful talk. Thanks for challenging me nearly a year ago to find a suitable name. I quite yeah. like the epithet Ossifer. 
Yes, you did a good job, Aaron. Thank you very much for this suggestion. And I'm glad that we did this because I don't want you to correct it afterwards. So I made sure beforehand that it's a name that you don't have to correct. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, another question from Balram. Uh, the question is, what about any specific or unique transcriptional factors or machinery for Loki archaeota members that distinguish both bacteria and eukarya? Mm, this is also a very cool question. And um, I didn't mention this enough yet. So what we are doing is we are collaborating with people, with friends in the field now who are really specialists. And mm -hmm. we have a specialist now, friends who are doing all the transcription related stuff. And I'm really also curious to see this and to compare. We haven't done this yet. There's a lot to do, but we are doing a lot now on transcriptomics and, um, and regulation and so on with collaborative partners. So we are giving what we have in terms of biomass, you know, out to people who are specialists in certain fields, because I think one group cannot really solve all these questions, right? You will yeah. hear about it, I'm sure, in the future. <laughs> yes. Um, the last question from Balram is, uh, what intricacies lies in the horizontal transfer of genes or gene cassettes that might provide metabolic or ecological advantages to Loki Archaeota members at these extreme niches? Yeah, this is a very good question. So we are looking a little bit into metabolic prediction now. We are... Um, mm -hmm. Doing a lot, it is still a little bit of a conundrum how they are really working, but in principle, we don't find new things. So if you want to discuss metabolism, one could go back to the excellent uh, predictions that have been done on metabolism. And also there has been uh, stable isotope studies, right, from the um, from Imachi's group, you know, functional studies. Our organism is quite similar in terms of metabolism. And what is special about it, um, what was the question again exactly? So how it interacts or how it is growing in this consortium? I mean, there must be hydrogen involved, we think, because it is a little bit, maybe they don't have a specific partner. That's the idea. Also from Imachi, I think, because they can grow with methanogens or sulfate reducers, same way, kind of, kind of. There seems to be a, uh, it seems to be favorable, actually, that they grow with sulfur dependent organisms. Yes. And they right. might need particular sulfur compounds for their hydrogenase. I remember now, but there's a lot of open questions now. So it's not really clear, but we have the hypothesis that they do a lot of interaction with other organisms. Mm. Okay. Um, Alessandro finally got a microphone. So he would like to ask it personally. Alessandro, you got two minutes. <laughs> can you can you speak up? Okay, until he gets ready, let me ask the next one. Uh, the next one is from Yankai Zhu. The question is: After culturing MKB1 and L ossiferum, what are the implications for culturing more Asgard archaea? Yeah. Um... I, I mean, there, there have been some enrichments, right? For example, at Caltech, Vicky Orphan and so on have published an enrichment on Heimdall Archaeota, not as high, but um, um, but also an enrichment. And I guess they have also not steered. So I would assume if I went for other Asgards, I would assume they also have complex cell structures. At least they also have this Loki actin, right? So I would not shake or steer, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But um but then it is it will be individual work, I think, to enrich to higher amounts. So I think uh, one has to come up with new ideas actually how to really culture them. So um, so it will be individual, I guess, to get um, a higher enrichment from this particular consortium that you get after the first enrichments. So I would play around a lot in the enri initial enrichments with different metabolic ways you know, with different media and follow carefully which one is favored of the Asgards, right? Because you might have several yeah. Asgards. We had also other Asgards in culture, but very low amounts. And then you have to do very tedious work to find out, I think. And it's a try and error. So to come up with more systematic screening for metabolic favorable, metabolically favorable conditions would be very helpful, I guess. Yeah. Um... 
there's a question uh, from a participant and the question is, uh, in my case, I have found ammonia oxidizing archaea always adhere to one or two bacteria in high purity cultures. I want to know if the AOA have cytoskeleton structures too. Ha. Um, I don't know if they do. I don't know if they do, but uh, no, I, um, I'm not aware of any, but I don't know if people have looked carefully. I don't even remember if they have any actin-like genes at the moment, but there is a lot to discover in the AOA, right? They are also in the deep sediments. They seem to produce internally oxygen to be able to do oxygen-dependent ammonia oxidation under anoxic conditions. Yes, they might do biofilms. Yes, they might do biofilms with other organisms, so tight connections with other organisms as well. That's what we have also observed. Okay. Um, I would like to take this next question, which is coming from a bachelor's student in microbiology. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is uh, from Sonu Kumar. The question is, do Darwin's selection theory of evolution also apply to molecules or enzymes, or do they just defy the stimuli in one go? As we see the diversity of life, which maintains synchronous with the environment, and it starts with the formation uh, slash designation of specific genes to the whole organisms as we found different compositions of RNA polymerase in group bacteria and archaea. Like, how do they know what mechanism is going to work against certain harmful stimuli? <laughs> uh, <whew. laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just recently listened to a, a, a very interesting talk about evolutionary theories. And um, it was very stimulating by Yogi Jäger here in Vienna, actually. And, uh, and I think he was right. I think it is very difficult to put all evolutionary um, parameters or ideas into one theory. I think we have to think more out of the box and, and um, think about different ways of how you can um, imagine that evolution works. And it is... It is complex. I mean, it is, of course, all the interaction with the environment constantly, but it is also this self-replicating machineries and this all works together. And I think it is very hard to make any predictions. And I, th I think they are just very different mechanisms working, right, in evolutionary terms. And um, it cannot be... Um, it cannot be only taken by reductionist approaches, right? And it's... Right. Uh, it needs broader theories, but maybe it's not possible to find a unifying theory on evolutionary processes. But this is really not my field. I'm really interested in following more on this. I'm also uh, stimulated by this, but it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, there's a question from uh, Ming Zhong. Uh, from Ming Zhong Wu from University of Queensland, mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent and insightful talk. I have a question. Uh, currently, yours and the Japanese researchers' enrichments are both Loki archaea. I'm wondering why. Is it because they are more abundant in nature? Or can we enrich some other Asgard archaea? If yes, what do you think is the key point to enrich them? Yeah, this is hitting a point. In my, uh, very good question. I think that we have had one step in our enrichment procedure where we used ingredients that were also published by Imachi. And we wouldn't have needed to do that, but we did it because we wanted to come to some support, right? So among the hundreds of different conditions, there was also one um, that was more similar to the one that Imachi published. And I think this is how we did it. We selected for something that is similar. We did that. And you can okay. see it also in our paper that this is successful one went through a step with this MKD medium, which is from Imachi. And I think we favored this. And I would love to go back now, actually, if I had the manpower um, and people would want to do it and select differently. So I'm looking forward to other people doing it. Yes, you will be successful, but it takes time. <laughs> right. Um, Balram has another last question. <laughs> And the question is, are there any steroid-like uh, steroid haponoids, molecular signatures for these members? Have these been investigated? No, not investigated. Okay. 
Okay. Um, um, but this is also very interesting. So this is relating to lipids, right? So yes, we are going for the lipids as well with specialists to look at the lipids, but it's also not trivial in an enrichment culture, right? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I'm intrigued by the fact that uh, to get an 80% enrichment, you mm -hmm. had to do uh, how many? Eight plus six plus two. So that's 16 transfers. Yeah. And that took two and a half years. So that's about 30 months. So nearly every two months you're doing a transfer? Uh, no, we are doing it more often now. But yes, okay. back then on average. So, so originally, because yeah. the culture takes time to adapt to the lab conditions. Yes, but the problem was more that we are not having a good tool to transfer them, and we will improve on that. I think it is the transfers that puts them, that gives them a back set. Each time we transfer them, and we can do it as careful as we want, we have mm -hmm. a problem, you know, but we have to transfer them, otherwise they die. So there is this moment right. where they die, and you have to catch the moment before they die with an enrichment as high as possible. So it's not trivial. So it means that you have a lot of cultures, they are stochastically overcoming their leg phase, you know, all of a the sudden they come up and you have to yeah. catch this moment and transfer them. That's the challenge, right? That's why you come up with this average. Sometimes you transfer faster because the leg phase was not so long, sometimes, sometimes not. So that was the challenge. And I think if we come up with a smarter idea how to transfer them and not deteriorate, maybe whatever they're, you know, 3D structure or whatever, then it would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you tried doing the transcriptomics on, on these uh, different growth stages? You've done the genome, I know. But mm. have you done transcriptomic work on these different transfer stages or these uh, different... Yes, we are uh, doing it right now. We are doing it right now. So we are looking at different stages. We have a second culture. You know, we are yeah. trying a lot of things now to find out which features are ruling this, but it is it is tedious, of course, right? Mm -hmm. um, because still, we don't have so much biomass. It's enough, but it's uh, but we will do this. I'm very curious to see different growth stages, actually. Yeah, let me try one last time uh, if uh, Alessandro is there. Otherwise, we'll just uh, close. Alessandro, are you there? Can you hear me? Costa, Alessandro, okay, let's let's just, uh, um, okay, we just got a last minute question uh, from Yang, Yang Kai Zhu. Uh, what are the unordered surface densities outside the cytoplasmic membrane of L. ociferum cell? Ha, good question. Very good question. They look great. I got several suggestions by people what kind of genes we should look for, but it was all negative so far. So yes, we have to do the exoproteome or whatever you call it for the to identify. This will be very exciting. But there are tools now to do it, right? In connection with maybe single molecule cryo EM and stuff like this. So um, so I hope we will find out, mm -hmm. but we don't know yet at all. So there was one question about the complete genome. I can answer that. There was also one in the yes. chat about, about was it a complete genome or not? So yes, it was complete. We have confirmation by different um, bins and stuff that it is really complete. But if you calculate bioinformatically, if a genome is complete, you never get completeness. It is because of the tool that you use, which is essential genes in Archaea or essential genes in Asgard that are predicted bioinformatically, right? So this is about right. cutoffs that you set in the bioinformatics. And right. so it's just a tool. So from experience, we know if we reach above 90%, it might be complete. And of course, we have done a lot of tests if the genome is really complete or if there was something screwed up. Yeah, right. so I hope it's... Yeah. Yeah. So, so in brackets we, was the one that was the predictor from the bioinformatics. Okay. Thank you so much, Krista. It was a fascinating discussion. Very, uh, you know, I, I see the excitement with you uh, while talking to you. You know, you <laughs> just ran to grab the calendar that, that you wanted to show on the screen uh, mm -hmm. to show the similarities. Uh, it, it's really nice to, uh, to have uh, a person with so much energy and so much uh, dedication to to work on a, on an ecosystem that takes ages to grow mm.
Mm. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. I I can imagine what what yeah. you what your lab is doing. It's great work. Thank you so much, and thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure our uh, our uh, next sessions for this year will consider this as a benchmark to to meet the expectations. <laughs> Thank you, so Thank you very much. You are very kind, and I really like it that you support this. Uh, that you're doing this lecture series and that you support novel organisms, people doing this kind of work and uh, yeah. And also have controversial discussions about evolution and stuff. So also great that you included yeah. it. Thank so you. The, the idea of Business Live is existing is because we want to create uh, sort of a graduate course uh, material uh, by mm -hmm. using these lectures. So the lectures are also available on YouTube uh, in about 24 to 48 hours, we edit the videos and post them on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, our uh, you know community can watch them later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So over, over the next, uh, I think uh, now we have 20 lectures already mm -hmm. on our channel and then we'll have the rest uh, from this year. So by the end of this year, we'll, we'll probably think about introducing you know, sort of a certification course. If you watch all these lectures, then we can have an exam session and mm -hmm. where uh, students can then, you know, see how, how much they store on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Nice very, very nice. Idea. Nice idea. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. yeah. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you to all the participants who have joined us for this inaugural session of our third year. And we look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, in the next session on March the 18th. Uh, we haven't decided on a speaker yet, but I'm sure that speaker will also be as exciting and the session will be as exciting as uh, Krishna's. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening and participating. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>